Welcome to Follow Your Curiosity, where we explore the inner workings of the creative process. I'm your host, Nancy Norbeck. My guest this week is actor Richard Oliver, whose experience covers the gamut. Film, TV, stage, commercial, audio, and even video games. He also directs for his own theater and teaches acting. Richard has been named Best Actor by the New York City Indie Film Awards and was a finalist for Best Actor from the Lockdown Festival. While we connected online thanks to the Minister of Chance, a Doctor Who spin-off audio series, here we talk about everything from whether drama school is really necessary, to the ways punctuation and breathing can help illuminate a character, to the importance of having fun with whatever you're doing, and everything in between. And we do also get into the birth of the Minister of Chance, both the character and the series, and its future. Here's my conversation with Richard Oliver. Thank you for for for, for asking me, because usually, usually Dan, I think Dan gets a little shy talking to people. So, <sighs> so I'm his sort of surrogate every time, you know what I mean? Every time there's an interview, he's like, right, Rich, you, you've been with us for a while. Can you go and... Um, Will you please? I see. People? So I can ask you all of the Minister of Chance questions then. I think so. I think I might be able to answer a lot of them because I've been um, I've been lucky that uh, well I, I was friends with with Dan first, so um, so I've known Dan probably best part of eighteen years, and then it was kind of wow. like from that friendship. Then obviously found out I was an actor, and then that's how we we kind of started working together. So, you know, he, he's quite good down with that. You know, he's quite honest in his casting and, he, uh, you know, and he sort of said, look, if, if there's something that I think is definitely for you, then, you know, I'll cast you. So, so that's, so I've been involved in pretty much every, uh, like uh, not all his audio, but pretty much like the minister, like September. And then his, his theater works. Um, you know that's how I kind of ended up, ended up involved. So it's been it's been quite good, really. That's really cool, and I want to get back to that. But let's let's back up to how it is that you ended up in acting in the first place. Were you the kind of kid who just knew from uh, the very beginning, or I don't know really. It's funny. I'd, I'd always I'd always say it's probably because I wasn't particularly academic at school even though I enjoy you know I could you know it's stupid because when you look back you always think oh, why didn't I why not just try harder you know I could do all mm-hmm. that. I could do those things um and I just ended up in a in a in a play at school and then from there um one of the um the teachers who was directing um just kind of said look I think you might have a chance at maybe maybe doing this so she kind of took me under a wing I joined um, a youth theatre, Manchester Youth Theatre, um, from being about 15 up to 20. And then, you know, she guided me through auditions for drama school. So so it was, wow. funny, it was funny, really, where I suppose I'd not, it, I don't know, it was just, it was never really a, a choice to say, oh, I, I just found that it was, I had a little go, I enjoyed it and just, and just wanted to do to do more so so i think it's more probably accidental than <laughs> you know and then you get to a point where you've been doing it 20 years and you're like you know you think to yourself well well actually there's not you know it might be a bit too late to change so <laughs> we'll we'll keep we'll keep on this journey now and see and see where it takes us but looking back though i've always you know and i even though i say probably high school looking back I've always, you know, whether it was junior school, always been involved in performance or little plays or, you know, the experience of line learning or performing at a, you know, in a community show with the school. So even, say, prior to me acknowledging it around that sort of 14, 15 age, looking back, I've probably always performed, you know, always kind of had had one hand in a performance of some mm-hmm. somewhere. So... So it just kind of just seemed that um, a natural, a natural thing to, to to kind of to kind of pursue, and I, and I think the fact that it's I quite enjoy the ch- the challenge as well of the, you know, of the difficulty, the difficulty of it. I don't know, I don't know why I enjoy that. Most people would probably go, <laughs> <laughs> go in. This is too hard. But um, but yeah, I think it was just more. 
more by accident than than choice I think. Mm -hmm. So when you say you enjoy the challenge of it does does it motivate you or is it just hey yeah. I can I can do this hard thing and therefore I'm going to. Well, I, think, I think it's a great motivator because I suppose in, in ordinary professions um, you know you get a job and that lasts for that lasts a lifetime you know in most instances and you, mm -hmm. I suppose there's a structure there where you climb the ladder you know you might start as the t-boy and end up the CEO where where obviously with this every you know every job you have to find you know mm -hmm. once your job's gone that's it you're back unemployed and you've got to you've got to discover discover another job so I think it's a great you know I think that that definitely is a you know is an exciting motivating thing because you never I suppose in a way you never quite know what what project you might be on you know and it's like you know even sort of the my friendship with Dan that then turned into you know some of the actors that that I've had the experience of working with you know are just are, are just phenomenal you know actors from all over the world you know big names you know like Sylvester or Paul McGann or uh, you know these these amazing actors um and and again it's it, it, that's what I love about it is is that you just don't you just never quite know mm -hmm. what you're doing next and uh, and where that's gonna gonna take you in terms of who you might meet or you know so I, so I, so I like all you know as well as it as a job I do quite enjoy the challenge of the of, of the industry and, and and trying to kind of, you know, navigate your way, mm -hmm. way, way, way through it. So, so yeah, I do find that's quite, that's quite cool. But it's kind of I, an adventure. Yeah. Well, that, and that's the thing as well. You never quite know, you know, like you never know where you're going to travel to as well, I suppose, you know, especially, you know, a lot of filming jobs are, are, are abroad now, or even, you know, even getting down to London or Edinburgh Fringe or, you know, it's a nice, exciting, exciting life. Or filming, you know, even filming, you know, like when we were doing the, we recorded a Sizzler film for the minister. Um, so we were up out by Peckerton Castle, which I think it was, they'd filmed, um, I think it was where they'd used it as a location for Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, I think. You know, the Kevin okay. Costner. Mm -hmm. Kevin so we're up in this, these glorious hillsides, you know, overlooking by this castle, even though it's like, I think it was at Victorian times, but it, I mean, it, they built it like, like a castle, you know? So I think that, that that's always exciting as well, you know, just getting to visit places that, that you might, you know, but I would never think to myself, oh, do you know what? I'll go for a little, little walk up and in there, you know, like mm -hmm. as entertainment for myself, but, but, you know, that's exciting as well, I suppose, not, you know, sort of being able to, to sort of play in and act in all these different places and environments, you know. So, so yeah, I do find it all exciting. I think. <laughs> so it's exciting enough that it overshadows the what I I shouldn't categorize it this way yet. I want to say perpetual rejection. Obviously, it's not perpetual, but still, it's it's a much more rejection filled career than a lot of them. Yeah, and I think I think I think for me, I think. I kind of tell myself that, you know, if a job's got my name on it, it's got, it's got my name on it. So I never feel like, you know, although the rejection, I guess, is hard, you know, like, like I just, I just, I got recalled for a really amazing play and I got down probably to the last couple and I didn't get it in the end. But, you know, and there is part of you that thinks, oh, but <laughs> you're prepared, you know, it's one of those where I think, you know, actually, when I prepare for an audition, I prepare as much as it as I can, you know. So, I, so it's one of them where I think, if, as long as you know you've done your absolute best and you're prepared, then you can kind of walk away. I suppose if you don't get a job and say, "Well, well, do you know what? At least I've 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 given that my full, mm -hmm. you know, my full, my full focus." And as well with this industry, you know, it's you know for every job you don't get there's a there's that potential that that director might bring you back you know so it's so i see although it is a lot of rejection um sometimes those rejections can turn into something a bit 
you know, a bit further down the line. Mm-hmm. So I don't really find myself ever getting getting miserable about about it because I think it's that thing. Like, I suppose I'm lucky that I always, apart from during the pa- well, even during the pandemic, I'm still doing some stuff for Minister of Chance. But you know, I, I always try and find projects that interest me as a person you know and that Mm. i want to explore um so you know i'd probably say that i'm always working on something somewhere even it might not be you know and i think that's the thing sometimes isn't it with with actors you know the first thing people say to you oh what have you been in have you been on telly have you been in you know like we have this big soap called you know coronation street have you been Mm -hmm. in coronation street and it's like i think sometimes it you know, I've tried not to allow that to define me just because I'm not <clears throat> been on, say, I don't know, EastEnders. Mm-hmm. Doesn't mean you're not an actor, you know, and it right. doesn't mean that that you're not working as a as an actor just because you're not. You know, I think sometimes, you know, it's, it's interesting. It kind of wonder whether people, you know, feel that if you've not got that high celebrity status, that you some that you're somewhat failed in your, <laughs> you know, failed in your career, maybe. Um, but I'm really lucky that, like I say, you know, I've been able to do to do the, the audio stuff, you know, I've done commercials, I've done theatre, you know, we own a small theatre where where I live, which unfortunately is short at the minute. Um, uh, so, yeah, so I'm really lucky that my journey has taken me, you know, it's not just one area. I've been lucky that I've been able to explore, mm-hmm. you know, Lots of different things. So I did a video game and a feature film, a horror film that's coming out uh, next year. So again, it's all different, you know. And you compare that to say the minister, you know, the audio. It's all very different, you know, different different themes on the same, you know, the same kind of work as an actor. So, so yeah. So I guess I'm kind of lucky in that respect that that this this year probably and probably because of the pandemic thing has been the longest probably that I've not really had, you know, mm-hmm. a, job, a job to job to job. But that's just because nobody's, you know, it's more. Right. It's more just because of what's going on than, you know, than say, because there isn't any, you know, because the work isn't isn't there. So, mm-hmm. yeah, so that's been an interesting year um, in that respect, just sort of. But, you know, I'm very lucky that, that this has been the longest time that I've not, you know, and that's kind of beyond my control, really. So, so again, I can't really, can't really moan about that because it's, yeah. <laughs> it's hopefully not my fault. <laughs> it is what it is for all of us, I think. It's strange. Certainly, it's longer than a lot of us had expected or hoped. Know, but so. people are doing such clever things, like it, you know, staged with David Tennant and Michael Sheen that you know they did mostly over Zoom, which is amazing. No, it's incredible, isn't it? And I think that's it. It has been exciting. You know, there's, you see lots of really interesting projects, you know, using these te- technologies just to kind of keep keep going. I've not actually seen that yet. It is on my list to watch because I do I do love both of those actors. So. <laughs> is, that on, is it on Amazon? That? I don't think so. I think it's coming to Hulu over <laughs> here, but I'm not sure when. Right. And I don't, you know, beyond that, I have no idea. But, it, you know, the, the two of them just, you know, there are little clips around and whatever. And there's, I discovered it when I stumbled on the one where Judy Dench bombs their Zoom call and <laughs> gives them both what for. And I just was like, oh, yeah, I got to see that. <laughs> it looks great. I mean, they did a very good job of making the whole thing look unscripted. But I think that that probably a good chunk of it was improvised. So, you know stands to reason I have to try and find which which channel it's it, it's on because i saw them when when um there was a little bit on twitter i think when they were doing it they both tweeted mm-hmm. like pictures and stuff about what they were working on but but yeah i've not quite managed to find what which one of our tv things it's on but i'll, I'll definitely take a look. i know there are so many now it's like I know. <laughs> keep track <laughs> So I wanted to go back to something that you said earlier, actually, to kind of combine two things if they combine, like I think they might, because you mentioned your teacher helping you prepare for for drama school auditions, and you also mentioned preparing for auditions in general. And I'm just wondering, you know, what what was it like 
getting ready for drama school auditions what what were the auditions like because it strikes fear into my heart just thinking about that because I know that's so competitive and then what do you what do you do to prepare now what does that look like for you um I think I think at that point I think because you're kind of starting out I don't think there's as much fear because you're not really aware of how tough it is you know to me at that stage you're just like oh this is you know this is this is kind of great and exciting without thinking really oh there's thousands of people I'm up against and you know not acknowledging the competition mm -hmm. that kind of naivety at the start probably guided me through in terms of my nerves because it was thing it wasn't you know might sound daft but say like auditioning for RADA because it was all new in my head I wasn't thinking oh this is RADA you know this is <laughs> territory and, and Branner territory and all these amazing actors that, that came out of that school for me because it was all new it was just like oh yeah this is just a, a college that you know we go to and we do do acting stuff so so I think the naivety probably at, at the start probably helped me kind of not kind of be be as nervy as I probably, mm -hmm. uh, I probably should but but I mean in terms of preparation my preparation really is 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 kind of just the it's still the, the same although over the years things have got quicker because you're used to you know say like learning scripts learning but in saying that there's sometimes i'll get a script and i'll it'll be like <laughs> climbing about and you know trying to get it into my head so it's not always as, as clear cut as that but i think that that like in terms of preparation for for drama school particularly um because i had my this friend helping me i mean i was really disciplined about that it was like every night working on my speeches doing a vocal study breaking the speech down and, and just kind of repeat 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 until it was until it was kind of second nature and mm -hmm. i would and i would say that 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 now preparation wise you know that foundation is still there of, of knowing that it's you know it's almost never ended your prep could be never ended you know you could forever be be <laughs> yes. practice 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 so you do have to say to yourself and sometimes right you know if this it, you know don't you know just let it breathe and take a and take a break but in terms of my preparation you know it always just starts with the with with the text for me and that's you know and I work with the text and try and get under the the pattern of the the you know the the breathing pattern that the punctuation might might give me and then from there hopefully once the breathing's right for me even though this probably sounds a bit actory but but the breath for me is so fundamental to the emotion that i always find that if i can breathe a breather passage of text right then hopefully the emotion and everything all falls into into place so so i think it's funny with your prep because i think you know i'm probably I probably got half a foot, you know, in Stanislavski, half a foot in Michael Chekhov, all these different practitioners that you pick up over the years. But I think eventually you just kind of using all of those tools, discover your own mm -hmm. your own way. You know, so sometimes I might keep journals for characters, you know, and do a whole biog of <laughs> where, <laughs> where my character's been. But I know some people will probably say, well, in terms of the kind of the 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 actual application and performance how relevant is is you know this was the, the daniel day lewis famous story that he built a he built a house for um oh was it the crucible when he was a crucible <laughs> i don't know how true this is but they said that that he built a house from scratch in his character using the tools of the time to get wow <laughs> Um, which I, you know, that is amazing if that is, if that's true, because that's kind of just shows the, the level of depth. But I suppose some people would argue, well, you know, does that really help in terms of, <laughs> you know, the, the actual delivery of, uh, of the text and, and, you know, and being the character. So, so yeah, so I probably prepare for lots of different, lots of different, lots of different sources. But a lot of it, I think I, I always start with, the writing, trying try to translate that, or looking at the punctuation, the rhythm that the writer's given me, and then just try and breathe that so that hopefully it'll free the right, you know, the right, 
the right emotion. So, so I think that's a lot of how I work now. Um, where obviously going back then was just trying to trying to perform it well, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, back when you're back when you're a bit younger, all you think about is I've got to be good, you know. How right. It's good, and then you kind of you get to a point where where you realise that that actually that's not within my power. You know, I could think I'm delivering the greatest Hamlet and the critics could say <laughs> you know, <laughs> half, a, half a star, you're, you're, you're useless. So, so I think, I think that would be the main difference is, is that probably I'm less obsessed with trying to be good that I, that I was when I was, you know, sort mm-hmm. of and, 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 and trying, um, you know, cause it's, you know, it's such a, performances you, you know it's your audience that are gonna gonna decide you know at any right. at any step and nothing no matter how much you prepared can kind of you know I feel sorry sometimes you know you go and see these great plays and then you see a review and you think oh my god you know that must be awful after you know 12 weeks rehearsal and all this time <laughs> you know and they're working their socks off you know nobody I imagine enters into anything you do thinking Oh, I'm going to make this the worst. <laughs> right? Yeah, nobody does. The worst performance, but it's so subjective that I think that as I've got older, I've kind of tried to get rid of that outside voice that says, uh, "You've got to be, you know, you've got to be the best. You've got to be, you know." I just try and do as much work, prepare as much as I can, and then hopefully, you know, that carries that that will that carries me through. But but yeah, it's a funny old. It's a strange profession. <laughs> you know, when you stop to talk about it, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, I don't think it's very often that I actually even think about it for myself and think, oh, what what do I actually do when I'm doing it? Just, uh... <laughs> well, once something becomes second nature, I think it's much, you know, if you had to break it down for somebody, it would be much harder than when you're getting to that second nature point mm. where you could say, I'm doing this and I'm doing this and I'm doing this. But once it ends up ingrained to yeah. to break it down again at least i find can be really hard you know there are things that i do that people say to me how do you do that I'm like i don't know i just do it just do it yeah. which is the least helpful answer ever <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and i think as well i think i think when i was younger you know i think i think the most important thing for me now when i do it is that is that it's got to be fun you know i've got to en- i've got to enjoy it and i don't know whether all people who attempt acting at some point go through this thing where they feel that it's got to be a torturous you know you've got to be this tortured soul to <laughs> you know to kind of enjoy the the performance of it so i think that's the difference is, is that is that now i very much you know hopefully the projects that i do i really really enjoy and that little oh i'm a torture you know a serious actor Bit. I can kind of, you know, I've kind of got rid of that now, and I think that, and I think that's a key thing, you know, with any of it is just, it's just it's got to be fun because I think if it's, you know, even if you're playing a murderer, it's got to be, the, you know, you've got to have the fun in that because, because I think the audience, your audience will always, you know, nobody wants to watch a tortured soul for right <laughs> three hours, you know, they want to share in that excitement and the enjoyment i think and the fun of the uh, that creative process you know you know so so i think that's interesting you know when you look at some actors who put themselves to absolute hell to kind of allow themselves to say i am an actor you know <laughs> mm-hmm. I, do it, I do find it really the whole aspect of it really interesting but i think yeah i think i think enjoying it now is, is really key for key for me whatever whatever part i'm looking at whether that's something you know not a very nice character or a nice character you know it's it's finding that that little bit of fun and fun and enjoyment in in there i think if that makes any sense (laughs) it makes complete sense to me i mean i i think there's a lot of truth to the idea that if you're not having fun nobody else is going to have fun with whatever it is you're doing you know if you're torturing yourself to write a song you might manage to write a beautiful song, but it, you know, the torture part is probably going to come through somehow, you know, somebody's going to pick up on that. And I've, I've said many times to people on this podcast before, you know, if you're not having fun writing the thing you're writing or playing the part you're playing or, or whatever, 
nobody's going to have any fun reading it. Nobody's going to have any fun watching it. They're just going to stand there. And like you said, you know, since they're going, oh my God, that guy is tortured. What's wrong? <laughs> Which is not what you're going for. <laughs> so, so yeah, I think there's absolute truth in that, that, that you need to have fun with it. And, and I'm remembering as you're talking that, and it's funny because I have Googled for this and have not been able to find it yet, but I would swear to you that, okay, I'm not going to, guesstimate how many years this was because I don't want to think about it but but back around the time of like the last police album or Sting's first solo album I remember reading an interview with him that like I said I can't find so <laughs> it's possible I dreamed this but I don't think I did where okay. he said something like pain is essential and if you haven't got any pain you have to go out and get some and it, so it probably went with King of Pain or something. Um, and, and, you know, I was like 13, maybe. So I took this very seriously. Here's this guy. He's saying this thing. He must know what he's talking about, right? And Lord knows, Sting was writing great stuff back then. Yeah. So maybe I'm not entirely right about the whole pain versus fun thing. But just a, within the last five or 10 years, I read another interview with him where he said, you know, I used to think that you had to have pain for everything. Now I think I have no idea what I was thinking. That was stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think there's something about, you know, what you learn as you get older that goes with that yeah. too, that, you know, you were more likely to take it super seriously when you're younger because you think that you have to take everything seriously. And as you get older, you just kind of go, yeah, whatever. Yeah, it's you funny. Know, so it's have just, fun with it. Yeah, definitely. I, I think that's that's nice, but yeah, but maybe it's just a growing up, you know, like you say, a growing up thing that, you know, you get to a point and you think, oh, well, this torturing myself was it, you know, was it was it necessary? Could could I have have like still played that part had I have not, you know, without mm -hmm. the, 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 you know trying to discover the inner the inner turmoil, you know, right? <laughs> can, can I just enjoy this and act, you know, and and just act it and and have fun. Um, so yeah, so maybe, maybe Sting's right. Maybe it isn't. <laughs> maybe it's just we all have to go through. Yeah, I kind of think there may be a thing like that. Yeah, maybe it's a discovery, a, dis a step of discovery on your journey. You know, your journey to, mm -hmm. to being creative. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and there, there's also something that was coming to mind as you were talking earlier that I want to make sure I don't forget. When you mentioned punctuation. Yeah. As as someone who writes and used to teach English and tutor English and writing, I think punctuation is, you know, this overlooked thing, mm. especially now if you look at Twitter or text messaging or the Internet in general, you know, a lot of punctuation is just gone. <laughs> but about 20 years ago, I went to a workshop just here in town and it it was with a woman named Anne Ochio Grosso, who was with a theater company somewhere out in the Midwest, and she had done a ton of Shakespeare. And the thing that really struck me was that she was talking about how the punctuation in Shakespeare literally tells you how to read something, yeah. which just completely blew me away. Because even though, you know, I majored in English. I had already written a bunch of stuff, even though no one will ever see it um, at that point. <laughs> it just had not occurred to me that that something as basic as punctuation could literally tell you how to say a word or a line. Yeah. And so I'm I'm just wondering, you know, what do you what do you do with with punctuation? Well what what I always try to do is is breathe to the punctuation. So I have not I've not got a script in front of me, but but say, for example, you, you take something like to be or not to be. Mm -hmm. That is the question. Um, um, I suppose it's probably fair to say that as humans, we only take in enough oxygen for that thought, don't we? We, we? we very rarely run out, you know, we might occasionally run out of breath, but it's not you taking some breath, say what you're going to say, and then you, your lungs are still still full. So the idea for me would be to take to be and just try and get enough breath breathe again and that allow that so where the comma is or where the, the break is is to take a breath there to take me in or not to be and then a breath where that's broken that is the question 
And then in the next line, you get a much longer breath. So you'd get three short sections, which if you're breathing quickly, I suppose you might be able to say, well, you're in a heightened state. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts, your mind's changing rapidly. So, so I would try and breathe each of those sections because then you get a very, very short to be or not to be. That is the question. And then you get a much longer phrase where it is nobler in the mind to, so, you know, so, mm -hmm. so I always find that using the punctuation and the breath allows you to discover the, 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 the psychological <clears throat> state of the character because you know, if they're if they're long, you know, drawn out sentences, you can you can I don't know. You just start to to hopefully feel the the rhythm of a of a person, as opposed to you know maybe you know that I have done on, on my journey. You know, you take a piece of text and you say, right, how do I make this really good? You know, and you can <laughs> kind of ignore ig ignore a lot of the you know, particularly like say with Shakespeare, it. You know, he, I think he writes for actors in such a such a superb way that you almost, do you know what I mean? He gives you the instructions to to perform it, like like you were saying that lady said. So, so I always, whether it's modern text or you know, or, or classical text like Shakespeare, I try and just match my breathing so that so that I'll take you know a half breath on a you know it, it, it oversimplifying it but you know a short breath on a comma a full stop change thought and a new breath on the on the new thought and then eventually hopefully you can kind of start to feel to to feel the mindset of of, of the character so so that's how i would how, how i would work and i think it's interesting that that you know, I always ask myself, do people actually, when an audience is watching something, are we reacting to the sound or mm. are we interpreting, interpreting, sorry, interpreting, that's terrible, interpreting, <laughs> you know, the, the words literally as we watch and what is it that makes me have an emotional reaction or connection? So I kind of, so when I'm working with text, you know, I, I do sometimes wonder whether it's more about the sound we're making. And obviously, you know, which language is shaped sounds. But, you know, I often think that sound is so, even without the use of words sometimes, you know, it's like if you, I don't know, I always use this with your students, but, you know, if we all bash our thumb with a hammer, we're all pretty much going to make the same sound. Or mm -hmm. if you've got a dog or a, or a child or something that hasn't necessarily got formed language, we still understand from the sounds that they make the emotional state so we know when our dog's hungry or you know so really when I look at text I try and and that's why I always try and come to the breath and the and the punctuation of it is because hopefully by breathing it right will unlock the right the right sounds and the right length of mm -hmm. a sound maybe or 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 give me the right placement of the you know like the 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 harshness of a of a, con a consonant sound might might make. So I just find it's just more of a a kind of a liberating way to work, and and it, and it's scary because I suppose you're even though I do text analysis and I do sit down and say right, okay, what exactly does this mean? I think it's a much more liberating way to work because you almost discover it, it, you're allowing yourself to discover the language as a sound rather than from more of a um, intellectual. Mm -hmm. actual viewpoint and and again be, and because acting you, you know really we're observing human emotion you know for me that always i always think that the breath is the you know the breath is the key is is always a fundamental point because we you know sounds stupid but we all breathe you know right. <clears throat> and we all we all make and we, and, and we all know, you know we all make you know there's a there's a kind of a uniformality sometimes in the way sounds people will you know it's really if people have pleasure or pain or mm -hmm. it's identifiable so so that's why i always try and treat the, the punctuation with with a little bit of respect in terms of allowing myself just to breathe breathe to the comment you know full breath on a full stop 
into the next into ne into the next door. Um, so I hope that answers the question. <laughs> so yeah, no, it, it's I'm very interesting. <laughs> you know, because like as a choral singer, a lot of the time it's kind of the same thing. You know, and a, a conductor will say, "Ignore this comma. Do not breathe where you see this comma," because it's natural to do that when you're yeah. singing. But also, I mean, I, I'm so intrigued by the idea now of do we respond to the sound or the words or the visual or, you know, and I have to think that on some level it's it's a combination of the three. Yeah. But, you know, there's that improv exercise where your lines are all gibberish. Yeah. <laughs> so you have no words and you're trying to convey whatever it is that, that your setup is yeah. with just you know strange noises because that's all you have or the same word over and over again or or whatever it's it's really interesting to think of it in in those terms of you know how do you get these things across which makes me wonder how we do that just in ordinary conversation that we don't even notice like we yeah. don't notice punctuation and we don't notice breath no and yeah because we, we just do it automatically don't we and i think that's mm -hmm. that's the interesting thing with with acting is is that you know you you have to almost try to break down all these processes that we just do and take for granted yeah and then to recreate them as if you and i were having this conversation now mm -hmm. so it's all a bit of a crazy you know i always think this is daft just learn it <laughs> you know, part of me thinks just learn it and say it who's who's gonna care you know but but part of me really enjoys the kind of you know the ideas behind you know that mm -hmm. practitioners bring to the table so you know, so a lot of this, I think a lot of this breathing stuff really came from, you know, one of my first voice, voice tutors when I was at, when I was at drama school, you know, when approaching Shakespeare. And again, I think certain things you learn, you adopt and, and keep with you. And then other things that don't work for you, you just, you just throw out, don't you? But, but I do, um, but I do like the technical aspect of acting as well. I find that quite, quite exciting. You know, what makes a great piece of performance it just you know it really intrigued you know when i think of you know you think of that you know you think of someone like olivier who was you know thought of as the world's greatest actor but probably wouldn't wouldn't get away with his style of performance you know in today in, as we are today right and i often think you know is it you know when you think of famous actors and they could be famous for what but for a number of reasons you know but hopefully it's because they're they're gifted at what, at what, mm -hmm. whether, well, you know, whether you're a musician or, you know, hopefully it's because they are. And I do often think, particularly when I work with student actors, you know, is, is it just something that you're born with mm -hmm. or is there a process by which you can learn those skills to be just as good as the, the actor that they're just saying, oh, you know, this, this person's born born with this gift so so i think that's what attracts me to all the the technical aspect is 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 it only a gift that you know the heavens or whoever has given you or right. can you can you learn this you know is is it is there a formula to it that you know if we put all the right components in mm -hmm. I, you know one i can create a student Olivier or, or <laughs> Cher or Kenneth Branagh or or whoever you know and, and I think that's what 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 always draws me back to 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 acting is 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 that constant question of is is this just are there just some people born with it or can we can we learn it mm -hmm. and, and practice it and you know because I suppose it's a strange thing because I suppose you know, you often hear that analogy that they say, oh, well, you know, you know, you are your, you are your instrument. You know, they say, you know, so I'll often say to my, you know, my, you know, students, you know, so, you know, if you're a guitarist, you pick the guitar up every day and you play it. I said, but as actors, it's a, it's a much stranger thing to get your head around, which is what, you know, <laughs> this instrument that I'm meant to play, you know, mm -hmm. it's, what's the, what's the, the formula? to 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 create that, that 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 kind of definitive definitive performance and, and then i get into well that will only last then for you know is it, it can you recreate then 
and, and uh, you know, especially when you're repeating performances in a play, you know, I start, right. and then I go, well, yeah, does it come back to you? You've just got to be naturally gifted. You know, it always brings me back to those, to those two questions, which is, is it something, is talent just something that, that if you're lucky enough to be given, to be given it, you've got it, or can, can you really just learn, you know, can you learn it like you would learn it? Mm -hmm. you know, learn a guitar or something so so yeah so so i'm always i'm 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 often fascinated with <laughs> with all with all right. those sort of things which which probably sounds crazy but i probably am a bit obsessed with the, with the idea of, of acting and what and what makes an actor it's it's something that i you know or an actress you know it's, it's just I, I i always come back to that same that same question all the time have there been students that you thought were naturally gifted that turned out not to be as good as you expected or vice versa? Um, I, I suppose we've been, we've been lucky over the years. A lot, of our, a lot of our students have really stuck with it, have kind of gone off to, you know, good drama schools. Mm -hmm. students and, um, funnily enough, one of, one of my uh, one of the lads that I used, to, that I used to teach, I bumped into his mum and he's, he, he's just finished Gildor. And he was he was working on something with David Tennant. Mm -hmm. Like, wow, that's that's, wow. that's amazing. You know, go go you, that's brilliant. And um, so I think with with some of the students, I mean, obviously, it, they everybody works hard, but I think the ones who kind of get to an age and think, do you know what? I really want to have a go at this, and have chosen it as a profession to train, um, have all got into college so so I, so i suppose it, it you know in that respect the the ones yeah they've 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 done good you know what i mean and it, and mm -hmm. it seems that, that, that the actors will either want drama school and want to do it as a profession or they'll just kind of go off and do and do something else you know i don't think we've ever had an actor that's gone on to take it the next step further and hasn't hasn't kind of got to the next point of their their training so so yeah so it's been so, so yeah that's, that's it's been really really interesting to see them you know apply this process and and kind of hopefully take it take it further um, but yeah that was amazing yeah D david tennant i was like you lucky boy <laughs> 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 really yeah what? He's doing really well. So, so yeah, so, so yeah, it's, we're pleased with that. That's been nice. That's great. <clears throat> Though I know you've also come to the conclusion that drama school is not necessarily a requirement. Yeah. And I know, like, I've, I've heard the story of how Peter Capaldi landed in Local Hero was just that some guy walked up to him when he was out with his friends and basically asked him if he wanted to do it. Yeah. So he's certainly an example of not necessarily needing to go to drama school and i'm just wondering what you have noticed about that i i think with drama school um i mean obviously these uh, these places are great you know you, you're getting your voice work you're done you know all the all the components that, that you need you know you're training on for three years and i think that the opportunity that that you know the bigger colleges give you upon graduation with your showcase mm -hmm. you know, direct link to agents you know of course you're going to stand a better chance if you're graduating rather than if you're i don't know coming out of some unknown mm -hmm. school so i think they do have their merits in terms of what they're teaching the actors about the profession and the you know and and, and, and the vocal training movement training all the different texts you look at i think it does give you a really good grounding in in the in it across the board and those opportunities of upon graduation but i don't know if if it's the only route because when i was younger i was kind of taught that that was my only way into the profession mm -hmm. so really the looking for work bit even though i'd done a little like i did a little tv thing and i've been on on tour, like educational tour, and they've done bits and pieces of, of work, so to say. I don't think I really acknowledged that I could work as an actor at 15, professionally. I think I thought in my head, oh, I've got to go to drama school, I've got to 
you know, before I can be an actor, you know, an actor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I think my opinion on that's changed. I think, you know, if uh, I don't think, I, because you're always learning and you use a specific set of tools for the job that, that you're working on, and given the fact we've got the internet and all these amazing resources at our fingertips, you know, you watch the National Theatre Actors online and, you know, yeah. there's so much that we can get online, um, you know, even down to acting acting lessons and all this mm -hmm. stuff. But, but really, I, I just think that, that it, nowadays I'd probably say I don't believe that it is the only, the only route in, but I would argue that, that getting into the profession, it's a good place to get seen. Because ultimately, and I think this was the thing as well, you know, when I was younger, I don't think I, like I was saying, I don't even think I ever thought about actually working. Mm -hmm. It was just more doing it. You know, I don't even think I acknowledge that somebody might pay me someday. I think I just <laughs> thought, like, oh, I do this acting. So, so, I do, <laughs> so I do think my opinion from being younger and thinking this is the be all and end all um and i think what changed that for me was was i worked with um i did a production of dr faustus and i worked with a um a, 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 the director was but was very much kind of a european european style so it was a lot of it was masks all the other characters were mask characters and it, and that kind of took me out of this quite I suppose I don't know whether it's in our English tradition and way of mm -hmm. actors. And I found that once I kind of experienced working in a in a completely different way, you know, talking about you know archetypes and mask centres and you you know in, in a more physical way. And again, I don't know whether that influenced me quite heavily to then kind of think, well, actually, is is this teaching me? everything every everything i need so mm. so I, I find that and again from a you know from a point of view that i suppose part of me feels as i've got older that really should that training be only available to the people who can afford it you know and right. only 30 people you know on a course you've probably got say 15 30 people in a year maybe and it just seems as i've got older i just thought do you know, is this, you know, the drama school route, does that miss out on people who, mm -hmm. do you know what I mean, who could have been, do you know what I mean, who could have really shone but don't have that capacity or finance or, right. or whatever to get to drama school. So I think there's been lots of things that, as I've got older that, that have influenced, that have influenced us to the pros and the pros and cons of it but I, I just say to you know any any the actors young actors i work with you know write off send a tape off mm -hmm. you know connect to a casting director and and ask them because i you know i'm always saying to them because you've got you know when i write as my 46 year old self <laughs> you know, they've got hundreds of these people who are like me all asking for work but i, I always say to my younger actors you know you've got you know, people love that enthusiasm. And if you're a young actor saying, hey, I don't really know much, but I've really got a passion for this, they're probably going to, you know, take you under your wing a bit and, and will want to, you know, sort of offer you help and guidance. Where, say, over, you know, old man me writing, they're going to go, you know, you should know better. You wait. You wait. <laughs> you can wait. You're getting in line with all the other old guys who could who've been doing it um so i do honestly think that, that, that if you want to act you should and again with the technology you know you can make a short film you can so much that you know you can do now even scripts or you know i used to have to go to a book you know get all the scripts off the shelf in the bookstore and look for something that was like more than five lines and you know and all, right. all these resources are so available but but, you know, I just say just start, start acting, just act every day if you can, <laughs> and that's the best way. I think that's you know the best way to learn. Yeah, I think just jump in and do it is often the best advice you can give someone. 
even if you don't know what you're doing, just jump in and do it and you'll figure it out over time and you'll meet people who will help you figure it out. And yeah. It's definitely, it's definitely, that's definitely true, you know, and I just think as, as an actor, you know, the most, when I think about where I've learned most has always been when I'm, when I'm working as opposed mm-hmm. to being in a class. Now, obviously, obviously in a class, I can get all the, all the knowledge to practice, but I always find that, you know, by attempting it, they're always the ones yeah. that, that I learn the most. Um, so, so I do, I do think that people want to do it, particularly younger people. I wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily worry if the thought of drama school is, is something that not, you know, isn't, isn't on your list. I do mm-hmm. think, given the amount of resources and courses and, and everything available to us, I think you can learn just as much with a couple of Google. <laughs> yeah. You know, or a voice app. I have a voice app now. It's brilliant. You know, it recognizes me voice and, you know, and I can practice my scales and, you know, I mean, you, even wow. you don't even need a tutor, you know, to, you can do you know, <laughs> it's mind blowing, you know, it's. It's mind blowing to think, oh, I could I just have these virtual singing lessons on my own. Yeah. Without Good grief. without going anywhere or a tutor, you know. And, uh, and I, so I do think that it's phenomenal the amount of resources available to well, not only learn acting, to kind of learn learn anything now, isn't it? You, mm-hmm. I guess you don't really you don't have to be part of these big institutions to, to kind of enjoy the that, that, that kind of learning process um you know even being able to watch you know keep, keep coming back to Olivier but but you know because I was doing this Shakespeare I've been doing a Shakespeare course myself you know like just you know, every mm-hmm. week we get to look at some plays and read out loud and you know it's been lovely but even being able to you know click on the computer and watch Olivier, right. Olivier deliver to be or not to be you know I, I mean that in itself is it is an amazing learn to yes. or watch Richard Burton or who, 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 whoever. Where, you know, when I was trying to learn, that would have been a, you know, I don't think my local video shop would have had. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, probably on, not. On probably not even your library. <laughs> <laughs> but I do, yeah, so I, I just find it sometimes mind blowing that that we just have access to 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 all these amazing learning tools and. Mm-hmm. That we can use to our advantage. So, so yeah. So I think to come back to the answer, I think I'm fifty fifty on, and probably somewhere in the middle of his drama school, the only way. Or mm-hmm. can it? Can you? Can you do it in another way? Um, All right. So <laughs> I have very very badly not left us a whole lot of time to talk about the minister of chance but i do want to do that because i'm just so curious to to know more about it i know that it spun off of a bbc doctor who story from about 20 years ago called death comes to time because doctor who is so good at titles like that (laughs) yeah and i know the minister was originally played by stephen fry i have actually heard death comes to time it's been do going on 10 years and honestly the only thing i remember is the brigadier showing up at the end of this part because a lot of it confused me but i loved the idea of a minister of chance and then i can't remember now if i listened to that because i wanted to listen to minister of chance or if if i found minister afterwards but i'm really curious to know how how that story spun off into its own thing where the minister is no longer played by Stephen Fry, but Julian Wadham is amazing. And there are several Doctor Who alums in there, like Sylvester McCoy and Paul McGann, and there's also Jenny Agutter and you. <laughs> so, so yeah, I, I really, I really want to know how this happened. I think, I think really, I can't remember the, the, the space of time between Death Comes to Time and, and the minister, but I think that that from talking to Dan, I think when he wrote Death Comes to Time, I think he wanted that to then kind of... Okay, I didn't realise he had written Death yeah, Comes to Time. Yeah, Dan... Dan okay, Dan, so there's an obvious yeah, connection. Yeah, so Dan, Dan wrote and created <laughs> Death Comes to Time, and I think he was at the BBC at that 
at that time and, it, and I think it well it must have got commissioned and, <clears throat> and he worked on it so I think there's always been from that point yeah I think he to serialize it and then I think kind of you know I'm, I'm, I'm sure he sent it off to places and and I think eventually what just happened over the time was I think Dan just thought do you know what I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of produce this myself you know and brought in his own producers and 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 then kind of the casting so I think from the initial one um the idea was always to to continue it but I think it just it just kind of you know trying to find the right way and the right format and the right place to to the platform you know, to take mm -hmm. that show out take that show out somewhere I think that's probably might <laughs> explain why <laughs> <laughs> why why there's a bit bit of time between the two but i think dan's or plan was always to was always to sit you know to serialize it in 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 in, in the way that he's done he's done now does that answer the question <laughs> <I'm a waffling. laughs> i think so and i'm realizing too that you know because it's been so long since i listened to death comes to time it is even fuzzier in my head than it probably would be otherwise and i did just re-listen to minister yeah. within the last few weeks because i knew i was going to talk to you and i wanted to kind of it, it took me forever to remember it wasn't this is terrible it wasn't until i got a gym membership and needed something to listen to on the you know <laughs> the bike or the rower or whatever that I was like, oh, right, I have all these things that I've been waiting for. Um, so that's probably not the ideal place to listen either, except that it very nicely keeps your mind off how many strokes you've done on the rowing machine. <laughs> it's the only way I'd survive. Um, but, you know, what I remember about Death Comes to Time is that it's a huge story. I listened to it on a road trip in multiple pieces, which probably did not aid my comprehension ability. Um, and you know there there are lots of of interesting and strange and surprising things happening even from you know when you're starting within the doctor who universe yeah. and it's kind of intriguing to me that that the minister is the character that he seized on to do this with mm -hmm. because there were any number of other things i mean there's this whole story where if i understood correctly it's like the seventh doctor is sort of trying to turn ace into a time lord which i didn't quite get how that would work which i think is probably why i was driving going hmm what <laughs> a lot of the way you know so that could have been its own story or you know anything could have been it, do you know if he had always seen this character even you know from the beginning of death comes to time as this needs to be its own thing yeah i, th I think i think so with Dan. i think i think he 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 kind of I don't know, he kind of seizes on central, you know, a central character or theme that he likes and then mm -hmm. kind of build, you know, build around that. So I imagine the minister, I couldn't tell you where where that, his idea for the minister came from. Um, You're not in his head, that's but fair. I do, <laughs> but, I, but yeah, I do think that it was something that Dan was very passionate about that about that kind of character leading, leading the way. Because we always... Has been talk now about trying to, you know, maybe write the the next, the next kind of second season or, or whatever. So hopefully, as well, we'll get to we'll get to do that at some at some point. But but yeah, no, I think I think Dan, um, you know, just gets his inspirations for these kind of characters that are going to lead his stories, and then and then goes goes from there. So. That's understandable. I've had that experience. <laughs> but but there was also a campaign to turn it into a movie, or am I misremembering oh. that? Because I know, as you said, there was the, the trailer for it, and then I don't think anything else happened with well, it. We, we made, we, we filmed four, how many days? I think we did three or four days um, at Little Morton Hall, with, and we kind of shot a uh, the prologue, the prologue episode. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, uh, Tim... McInerney was the king in the live one and, and, and Paul McGowan was was Jorian. So we we did create the prologue as a as a film and that is still there kind of as uh, you know as as a as a project. So I think the idea is is is, is to try and take all these things, you know, into other mm -hmm. into other formats and other and I think that's why Dan uh, you know has been doing the ten minute episodes to try and you know, finding more, you know, more audience of it. So, so I, knowing Dan, I imagine that 
the idea for the film is, you know, it'll still be there. It's just a case of how and how and when, because obviously, you know, like, I don't know, do you, I suppose you've got our, the argument of, do you need a, you know, where are we going to show this? Does it only exist on, right. or, or can we take it to a, take it to a wider, you know, a wider audience, whether it was serialized, but, because I think one of the routes we wanted to go down was even, you know, serializing it for television as well. So all those ideas are still, you know, are still, are still there as, as far as I know, but, um, but yeah, no, it was, it was really good doing the, doing those, having that couple of days film and it was great. And, and stuff. So I think, I think that hopefully in the future that will be used as support for, you know, taking it into a more of a visual, a visual medium with the episodes at, at some point. Because I think ideally Dan would like to have the minister as a TV, you know, as a, mm-hmm. in, in a, a TV series format. I think that would probably be the, be the ultimate place for it um but yeah so hopefully um you know we'll get to work more more on film as as we, as we go on because like i say we did i filmed with julia and we did like a like a little sizzler reel for the, mm-hmm. the audio series where we we filmed up in petriton and then um and then we did the the actual prologue film um so i'd like to think that you know when the time's right Dan would get that chance to, you know, because I think it'd be great as a TV, you know, TV series. It'd be fab. Yes. Um, Because it's so visual and it's, you know, it just feels, when I listen to it, it's just so visual, the kind of, you know, the descriptions of the frost bridge and the marshes and the, I just think, oh, wow, this would be the big budget, (laughs) you know. Yeah. And, um, you know, in a studio somewhere. Um, it'd be really cool to to make that. Um, so hopefully, you know, in the future, um, we might see might see that happen. <laughs> that would be great. I mean, it it is it is a big. It's interesting because it's really only you know five episodes in a prologue, yeah. and the episodes are each half an hour, forty five yeah. minutes. So it's it's big but it's not huge you know it's it's not it's not a multi-volume set of books you know but it's still it's it's a very big story and it has you know all of this political intrigue and the scientist who has to work on building a, a bomb who refuses to work on building a bomb and and then you have the minister who can move between worlds and he's chasing someone who has the same kind of power that he does and then, you know, you eventually end up finding out that there's someone else with that kind of power who doesn't know that he has it, but he's figuring it out. And oh, dear God, now what? Um, so so it is. It's 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 got enormous kind of drama and, and themes to it, even though it's fairly compact. So it would be really interesting to see what would happen with it on screen and in, you know, larger chunks so you could even explore some of those things. Yeah more though i'm sad that paul darrow would not be able to be on the cast anymore since he's not with us but because he's phenomenal especially toward the end in that paul darrow sort of way though i mean the whole cast is amazing because how could it not be with with that list of names on it brilliant at, at, at finding actors i think I don't know how he does it, but he seems to always have like <laughs> just most phenomenal people, you know, you think. I often think, how did you get that actor? Who do you, do you know? <laughs> <laughs> or who did you happen to ask at just the right moment? Well, I think he, he casts really well, Dan, you know, and I, and I think, you know, because for a while I, I used to think as my friend, I used to think, why, why put me in something? You know, and I'd, I'd think, why? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and he'd say, look, when I know there's something that I think is right, I'll let you have it kind of thing. And then, but when you look at the cast that he do, does have, um, you know, I can't think of any other actors playing, playing those right. roles. I think, yeah, that is a, that's a brilliant, that's a brilliant choice. Yep. I can kind of see why, you know, and I think that that's just mm-hmm. done how it works. And I don't know if he does that when he creates a character, whether, um, I don't really know if I've spoken about Death Come, 
to time as to which way round he went. You know, did he did he have did he always have Stephen Fry in mm-hmm. mind, and how much did that, yeah. and how much did that influence the 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 creation of the the oh what an excellent so, question. so I imagine knowing Dan he probably I, I imagine he visualizes the actor that that he wants and then and then writes. Well, and I can't lie. I think that's really why I was curious about Death Comes to Time, both because I wanted to know exactly what a minister of chance was and the fact that he was played by Stephen Fry. Yeah. It's like Stephen Fry in Doctor Who, as someone called the minister of chance, I need to know more about this. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. So, um, yeah, no, it's it's, it's, it's interesting to see, to see his cast. Because like with the light of September, you know, that cast was was all over the... You know, there were people in Norway, people in America. Oh wow! You know, we were we were kind of recording that all remotely, like across because obviously we couldn't get all the cast because people were working on other things. But mm-hmm. again, you know, you think you know, like Laura Laura Kiwet was in like it's September, you know, you think, you think, oh, that's really quite inspired and inspired the choice. You know, she's kind of perfect for that, and I always think that with Dan when I listen to Dan or watch his stuff, I think. Yeah, you're really good at you're really good at your casting. You you get <laughs> seem to match the right actor to the role, which which I think is impressive. <laughs> well, and I have to think because part of what I noticed when I was listening again was just the wordplay in mm. it. You know, is is just so phenomenal. There there are lines, particularly some of Julian Wadham's lines, but but certainly not only his where I just would think, wow, I need to remember that one for future reference. <laughs> you know? I mean, that that character has a, a real talent for the sarcastic put down that almost takes your mind off of how much of a put down it is because you're just sitting there marveling at it. <laughs> so I have to think that if you're fortunate enough to be called to do one of those characters you're just sort of sitting there going wow this is amazing i get to say these phenomenal lines yeah it's only i always i do love working with them and and it's strange because it's only it's only about five miles down the road from me it's it's quite weird how all that works (laughs) because he's um he's currently writing a version of of king arthur at the minute for the stage hopefully that's called hold excalibur um, so we were we were looking at taking that to Edinburgh, as a as a, mm-hmm. obviously with the the virus thing we're not sure. So hopefully there'll be more there'll be more about that as well in the coming months as as as, as well as minister. Great. So that'll be that'll be another exciting thing to to work on. Indeed. Well, I'm wondering. I mean, I'm definitely going to put links in the show notes to Minister of Chance and. And I'm wondering if there's anything that anyone who checks it out and wants to see more of it can do to help it along to its next step. Yeah. I think I think really it's Dan. I think the best place is just Dan's website uh, website because um, from there, uh, that's just the hub really for you know if he's crowdfunding or if he's whatever he's doing to to work his his projects. That'll be where everything everything will be on okay. danfreeman.co.uk um site um so so hopefully that's the best place to find anything related with <laughs> you know not just already the works and i think there are links there to light of september too which i haven't listened to yet and want to yeah so. and there's another cool i don't know if he's got fan, fantastic as zinc fantastic as zinc i think that's how you say it is another one of dance uh, audios and that I think there's a link on his website to that might be to, All right. that's really cool I'll have to check that one out too that's our show for this week my thanks to Richard Oliver for joining me and to you for listening if you know someone who might enjoy this episode please do share it with them thanks so much you can find show notes the six creative beliefs that are screwing you up and more at fycuriosity.com I'd also love for you to join the conversation on Instagram. You'll find me at FY Curiosity. Follow Your Curiosity is produced by me, Nancy Norbeck, with music by Joseph McDade. If you like Follow Your Curiosity, please subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. 
And don't forget to tell your friends. It really helps me reach new listeners. See you next time.